Afternoon to Cornwall is just after uh, 2.30. So it sounds as if the beast of Bodmin Moor might have, or even might have a cousin in Gloucestershire. Or the beast of Bodmin Moor has cleared off up uh, a few miles up the motorway. A group of water company workers have told how they spotted a big panther-like cat in a field near the River Severn. The men were working in a field near Box, uh, Boxbush Farm, uh, Rodley in Gloucestershire, when they saw this beast. Well, the worker, Bernard Dawson, from Berry Hill, Colesford, Gloucester, uh, told reporters, and I quote, it was jet black, sleekish and low on the ground. It was about the size of a Labrador, but it was definitely not a dog or a domestic cat. So, you may be in East End, I don't know. Could this a creature from Gloucestershire possibly be related to our very own beast? Well, on the line is Rick Minter from the Big Cats in Britain. Mick, Rick, uh, Mick, Rick, Rick, good afternoon to you. Hello. <laughs> good to get you on the programme. So, look, how commonplace are wild cats uh, in sort of an open countryside and forest areas of Britain? Well, of course, we don't know that because it's not officially being researched, although sort of voluntary uh, bodies, uh, networks of, of people who are interested in the subject, like Big Cats in Britain, which is a sort of group of uh, vol volunteer sort of investigators, sort of look at the subject and network together and keep in touch. And certainly if you look at sort of local newspaper reports and, and the Big Cats in Britain website sort of has a sort of gazetteer of, of all of those sort of pretty up to date and, and going back over the years, you will see that they're pretty common right through all sort of counties in, in England and uh, parts of Scotland and Wales. So, uh, and if you think sort of even if just a proportion of those, a small proportion of those have got some validity, then there's quite a lot of sort of genuine or very interesting sightings right across the UK. So you're not alone in sort of parts of Cornwall in having sort of sightings ongoing through the years. Um, I, I suppose it's fair to say the Beast of Bodmin has become a very well-known brand over a period of, well, 30, 40 years, I suppose now. Do you think that your feline of the forest might ever gain similar celebrity status? Well, of course, um, in this sort of uh, a bit part of the world, it, it's sort of well known that Gloucestershire is pretty good for sightings, and, and for the Forest of Dean, because it's a very thick, mixed sort of forest, woodland cover area, has um, locally is well known for sightings, got, got a good history of them. But, of course, it doesn't have that sort of national tag that the Beast of Bodmin, or even, dare I say, it, the Beast of Exmoor, closer to you, has. And so a lot of people sort of associate the big cat sort of legend and phenomenon with your part of the world. But, of course, it is um, sort of quite widespread. And, of, co and, and of course, they may be related. We, we, we don't know. But um, we assume if there's a breeding population that they can spread, and particularly when a, a young male needs to set out and find a new territory, it will spread further than a young female. And so that's why they might be spreading and, and getting sort of common across, the, not common, but, but you know, sort of being uh, spreading across the, the country. Uh, because I suppose, I mean, Cornwall has, to a certain certain extent that area sort of cashed in hasn't it uh with the beast of bombing i'm supposed people come down here to see if they can cite it is, is there more you can do to exploit the fact that you may have something similar well it's an interesting but it, it, interesting to know what, what sort of how people are sort of exploiting it in, in your term or sort of maybe getting a bit of a livelihood um from it or, or just just giving that the name a tag and benefiting from that somehow I, i've seen sort of people who run sort of wildlife watching sort of tours in Exmoor, for example, um, putting on the side of their Land Rover, you know, we, we visit the beast of Exmoor country. And of course, you've got a couple of um, beers. You've got Rutland Panther in Leicestershire, um, uh, Rutland Panther sort of bitter, and you've got um, beast of Exmoor um, bitter. So you've got a few things which are sort of riding on the back of that local legend and folklore and a few, a few sort of local booklets being produced. So it's interesting that it's sort of becoming branded in that way. So a few people are benefiting slightly and partially from it. Should, should people generally worry, though? I mean, I'm guessing these animals are unlikely to attack humans, aren't they, Rick? Well, that's the assumption, really. And, you know, if they have been around for decades, and it, and it does seem, uh, you know, that one can assume that, that there's some validity to some of the sightings and that, um, so that some of them have been around for decades... And, and we, we, the only sort of alleged incidents are a few sort of scratches here and there, and even some of those are doubted. So, uh, and uh, you know, if you read the textbooks about leopards, if we think some of the black ones or most of the black ones are leopards, and we're not even sure about that, but that may be the case, and, and some of the brownie grey ones are pumas, or also called mountain lion, and, and the sort of small bobtail uh, pointy eared ones are lynxes, when, are lynx, then. Um, they are, if you, you know, their, their natural behaviour is to be very shy and elusive and wary of humans and, not, and want to sort of beat a retreat when they sort of hear us or sense us. 
perhaps the only kind of time to be really wary would be is if, if you sort of went into a I don't know, a cave or a quarry or a, a sort of old barn or something, and the animal was sort of cornered, if you like, just because of the situation and wanted sort of to, to, to beat it, and you were in the way. I mean, that's the sort of situation to get yourself out of the way of a, of a cat which wants to sort of, sure. uh, you know, flee, as it were. And what sort of, what would their diet be then, sort of, um, I don't know... Natural game, really. The things that are deer, uh, you know, the, the, um, deer, some of the best evidence for these animals is the actual sort of half consumed deer. Um, and you, you can see some of the sort of hallmarks of a, of a, of a cat kill and, and consumption on them. And sometimes it looks like more than one animal has been at their carcass. And so that's why, you know, one of the, again, pointers to evidence of there being a breeding population that there's, you know, sometimes apparently two around. So, so deer, certainly, and we've got a lot of deer in the country, in many parts of the country, um, rabbits, pigeons, um, even thought that you know, people sometimes say they see a fox being chased by a by a big cat, and that's quite conceivable because leopards, you know, like like dogs in their own in their own in mm. sort of normal country. So, um, yeah, sort of. But even mice and voles, you know, they're, 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 we're even creatures like wolves will take um, mice and, and voles. Very nutritious to really? eat a whole mouse li live, and if it's you know, they're very easy prey. Plenty of rabbits, plenty of pigeons, plenty of peasants, and that sort of thing, and probably very very. Um, unlikely to regularly take sort of livestock like sheep. I mean, occasionally you do get a spate of sheep kills that farmers do think is a cat. Sometimes it may be a cat, sometimes it may be a dog. Um, and when, when an animal is uh, taken uh, like a deer or a sheep, it's very clinically dispatched and very clinically eaten. So when people say that a sheep was sort of torn to pieces, you, t and, uh, you tend to think, well, maybe that wasn't a cat because a cat dispatches sure. something very clinically and eats it very clinically. But they, they, we, we think it, the, the, the sheep are sort of too fatty, if you like, and the sort of wool is too much hassle and there's plenty of other natural prey anyway. It's a fascinating subject. Um, Rick, have you ever seen a big cat out in the wild? Yes, I have, and that's what sort of prompted my interest, really. And then I've, a couple of times I've seen smaller, what appear to be small, slightly smaller exotic sort of cats. Uh, um, and, yeah, once you know, and when you're sort of in this sort of uh, game, if you like, you, when you speak to people about it, you can quickly sort of think, uh, you get the emotion and get the sort of consistency of, of other types of sightings which are more plausible, and you sort of, you can rule, them, you know, you can filter them, if you like, and um, that one that you read out earlier from the sort of uh, River Severn area, Forest of Dean area, was fairly consistent, you know, people caught, say, Labrador size, stre you know, stretched Labrador, they initially thought it was a black Labrador sure. or something similar. So uh, they're, they're pretty consistent. And the movement, it's the fluid movement that's often very consistent. And, and I'm before. guessing a lot of these wild animals are in the wild now because of a change in government legislation. I mean, years ago, I used to know a guy called, I think it was Hugh Sinclair in Tintagel, and he had a, a pet puma or, or a jaguar or something. He used to walk down the high street with it on a, on a metal chain. Yeah, there was a guy on telly, wasn't there, that, that was reported. I think that was a puma, Matt Mountain Lion. Yes, and people did do that. That's right. And, and there are still some that, you know, that are li have, they have to be licensed. Since the 76 Dangerous Wild Animals Act, um, officially, if you've got a, one of these kinds of animals, they have to be licensed and you're inspected once a year to see you, you've got responsible you know, approach and, and, um, and facilities and things. But, of course, some, may st some people may have them in unlicensed conditions. And e even things like little uh, smaller Bengal cats and designer cats, people let loose sometimes because they just they may have paid some good money, a few hundred sure. pounds for something, but they let them out because they get a bit feisty. Well, if they let a small cat, exotic cat out, they may well let a big cat yeah. out. And we're not suggesting that, of course, uh, with the person I've just mentioned. Hey, listen, no, Richard, no, no. brilliant talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for coming on. Thank you. OK, 01872 if you want to come on air, please. Uh,